All right, guys, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. As soon as I can figure out how to turn on that TV. Um, hey, guys, I'm Dan. Hi. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, stroke today and uh, have a slightly controversial uh, topic about TPA. Um, some of you all that have been here for a little bit know that there's a controversy about TPA. Some of you all that are fairly new may not know. So we're going to talk about that today. So I got no conflicts of interest um, at all about this. Don't take money from anybody. What? No, I, I cannot do his voice at all. <laughs> I'm offended that you would ask. <laughs> no, I don't. So we'll start with the case. You got a 67-year-old fall down, found out to have stroke-like symptoms, and then they get to you an hour or so later. This is kind of best case scenario. I don't think I've ever seen someone with suspected stroke that actually got to me much sooner than an hour, because that's really, really quick. And that's actually rarely seen. So show of hands, who thinks that, that thrombolytics, being TPA, are standard of care for stroke that meet current guidelines? So we're saying less than three hours, there's no bleed, significant stroke. Raise your hand if you think that that is standard of care. Offering or giving? We'll say that you should give it. So now we'll say, should you offer it? Okay. So most of the room says you should at least offer it. I didn't see more than maybe one hand for you should give it. Would you give it to a family member? Okay, so let's say that you're there and your mom's there and she's the lady that, that fell down and found out to have stroke symptoms, okay? We'll say that all the stuff that we said before, so it's quick, you know, it's an hour and a half later after the, the stroke, she's got these symptoms, they're significant enough to where people would consider giving lytics. Would you counsel your mother if she like looked to you because you're there in the ER with her? Would you counsel your mom to take TPA? Okay, got, got a few more hands for that. And would you want it yourself? Let's say that was you. Let's say that you're the 67-year-old woman, which is a pretty big change for Merwin to become a 67-year-old woman. <laughs> but, you know, oh, he's not even here. That's it's terrible. Thing, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't closely look at his uh, interview packet. Maybe all this time Merwin's been a 67-year-old woman. I didn't know. Uh, but would you want it yourself if you were that patient and you met all these criteria? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, part of the frustration is that the number of times that you raise your hand for should we offer it to our patients, should we offer it to a family member, and should we offer it for ourselves should be roughly the same, okay? Reason being, if a treatment works, we should go for it. And if it doesn't work, we should abandon it, okay? And I'm going to talk about what I think from my current reading of the literature and how for all of these I would actually lean towards the no. So... I'm going to say that the TPA is not a proven therapy, that we just don't know enough about it, and the literature, if you really deep dive on it, is actually not very supportive. So I'm going to cover five myths of thrombolytics. So one is that TPA is special, that all the information about older ones like desmotoplase or streptokinase don't apply to, to TPA or altoplase. Okay? The other myth is that it causes a Lazarus effect, because if you ever bring this up with neurologists, they'll say, yeah, I, I pushed it this one time, and then like 20 minutes later, they were able to play the piano, and it was beautiful. And they couldn't play the piano before, and it was entirely because of TPA that they learned. It, it's just this weird, weird thing, okay? Number three is that it was consistently beneficial, okay? So part of the reason that so many people are supportive of thrombolytics and stroke is because the only um, studies that we talk about were the positive ones, somehow forgetting all the ones that were negative. Uh, fourth is that it should be standard of care or considered that it's standard of care. And the fifth is that this is the only thing. So often people will say, well, if you don't believe in TPA, it's the only game in town. There's nothing else that can actually help these folks. So, so stop your yapping because we're just throwing a Hail Mary. So we have to say what's a stroke. We know what strokes are, okay? There's the ischemic, which is the ones that we're talking about for the rest of this when I say stroke, and hemorrhagic. Please don't give TPA to hemorrhagic strokes. I'm pretty sure there's no literature on that. So it's just as well supported as the other, but uh, don't give it to hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, strokes are terrible. This is the mandatory boring demographic uh, slide. If, if you didn't know that strokes were a problem, uh, you should really restart. Um, so why not only focus on TPA? So we brought this up earlier. It, isn't it special? And the reason is that, that, that people are so focused on it is that it costs a lot of money. Okay, And I feel like some of this debate about whether it would be a good drug or not would largely go away if... This was a, a $5 drug. Okay. Saves lives in trauma. There wasn't this like upwell of support for it. 
in many areas, partially because the drug's practically free. And so there wasn't anyone to make money off of it. So what are they? They're basically clot busters, okay? And we have to have this horrible physiology slide, but there's too much to cover. So uh, yeah, there's the thing and the pathway and sure. Uh, and if you know what plasminogen is, it turns out it turns into plasma and TPA affects that. There you go. That's all you need to know. Uh, so myth one, is it different? And so I'm going to talk about the heart attack literature, okay? So back in the day when old people were on the earth, uh, there were a lot of questions about what we should do for heart attacks, okay? And it wasn't very clear at all what we should do. Should they go to the cath lab? Should they get lytics? And more importantly, which of those folks should go to the cath lab and who should get lytics, okay? And it's easy to look back if you have really only practiced medicine for a few years and think, of course we know that you should go to the cath lab and give lytics to STEMIs and forget that, wait a minute, they didn't know that for a long time. There were decades and decades of people having heart attacks. They knew they were having heart attacks, but they didn't know who should get aggressive treatment up front and who should basically just be watched to make sure they get better. Okay, and we didn't know for a while. So when they took a look at, at lytics for, stroke, or for heart attack, rather, it's overwhelmingly positive. It's not a huge benefit, but a very noticeable one. So you basically get a mortality benefit. And that's about a 2%. So you, you need to treat roughly 50 folks or so with lytics if you didn't have a cath lab in order to save a life with a, with a STEMI. Okay? And they had a huge number of patients, nearly 60,000 people, over nine trials. And the studies were consistently positive. They all honed in, give or take a little bit, at that 2% mortality benefit. None of them were negative. Okay? That's huge. And I want you to keep this in mind that it's not that medicine studies are hard. They are. But this was a very, very consistent finding in study after study. Interestingly, TPA actually had a worse performance for intracranial hemorrhage than streptokinase, which was a, an older lytic that's rarely used now. Okay? So it's very curious that that became the standard of care, um, quote unquote, for um, use in strokes because it's the one that's more likely to cause brain bleeds. So what about strokes? So now we only have 8,000 people, which is about one-seventh of what they had before, okay? The majority of studies are negative, and we'll talk about that. There is a much higher risk of stroke, possibly because that tissue is already damaged in the brain because it's got ischemia, and so it's more likely to bleed than if you're just having a heart attack and your brain's fine. And there was no consistent time-based benefit, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later, okay? So check the scorecard, all right? Everything looks better for the use of lytics and STEMI, and everything looks much worse for stroke, okay? So, but this is what I'm talking about here, that we didn't know who should get it, okay? If you pushed lytics on every instemi that walked through the door, you're going to be killing people because it doesn't help them, okay? Turns out it took us a long time and tens of thousands of patients to figure out, oh, these folks with ST depression shouldn't go emergently to the cath lab in the next hour. These folks with ST elevation really should, and the same thing for lytics, that if you present and you're having an ST elevating MI, then you should get lytics. And if you're not, you probably shouldn't with a few exotic, you know, Wellens and whatnot. We can talk about that later. But those folks really shouldn't be getting um, lytics unless you have that. And we have no idea with, with strokes who should and shouldn't. So we're going to go really quickly through 12 trials. This is just a, a slapdash run through every major randomized controlled trial of um, lytics for stroke, okay? At the top, you'll see different colors of headings, okay? If it's blue, it means that there was no benefit. They ran their study, and they didn't really show that it was better or worse, okay? If it's green, it means it was positive, okay? Or at least reported as positive. And if it was red, it means it was actually stopped early due to harm, okay? See if you can find a pattern. So this was the first one, masked in Italy. No benefit, less than six hours with streptokinase. Please note, Tons of people are talking about using lytics for less than six hours, and uh, it didn't really work. Then ECAS, everyone likes to talk about ECAS 3, forgetting that they probably had an ECAS 1 and 2. Hmm, interesting. They, uh, they used TPA for this one for less than six hours. No difference in disability or death. NINS 1, again, people like to talk about NINS 2. Well, NINS 1 was robustly negative. And so this was um, deficits at 24 hours. This is our study that looks at the Lazarus effect, okay? If anyone ever says, yeah, yeah, I pushed the lytics and they got better right away, that person might be having a TIA. And the reason I say that is that there is no data at all in any randomized controlled trial for lytics and stroke that shows that people got better within one to two days of receiving them, period. It's not there, 
okay? So you may have personal experience where they got better, and that's fine, but I actually had a patient that I thought was actually having a stroke. The neurologist wanted to push lytics, the resident did. The attending came down, found out that it was some really weird migraine thing, and she got better, <laughs> okay? So if it was really just me and the resident, she would have gotten lytics, and she would have been that Lazarus effect. Didn't happen. She got better on her own because she was having a weird migraine thing, okay? So this is your Lazarus effect study, and it was robustly negative. NINS2 is reported as positive, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, this is the thing that actually got TPA on the map. Okay, so if you look back, though, how many studies? So you got negative, negative, negative. Oh, we got one. Now it's standard of care. You better give lytics. And that's what happened. Once NINS2 occurred, people started talking about how can you not give this? It, it makes people better. Okay, we'll talk about all the problems of that study later. Now we got our first actually not just negative, but stopped early due to harm because it turns out people were dying. They had 47% mortality in this study. Admittedly, the placebo group had 38% mortality, but this was a number needed to kill of 11. <laughs> and that's not a comfortable sentence to say during your lecture. <laughs> they stopped halfway through because they're like, turns out we're murdering people, y'all. And so they're like, yeah, we better, we better cut that out. <laughs> and so that's what they did. And this is the very group that you would think would be the most benefit, okay? They're the moderates to severe strokes, all right? Smart neurologists have honed in, not on the little bitty ones. You know, if you have just a touch of aphasia or, you know, maybe you have just a little bit of motor weakness, very few people are arguing for lytics for those folks. So this is the group that you would think. They had terrible looking scans that showed large clots in big vessels, but it actually just killed people. Then there was the ASK trial. Again, we uh, sort of kind of killed people, and so we stopped our trial early. Uh, then ECAS-2, uh, again, 800 patients, much, much larger than, uh, than NINS-2, and uh, still no difference. Atlantis-B, again, we, we stopped early. This one was more because it was hopelessly not going to work, but it was actually trending towards negative. Atlantis-A, again, which paradoxically came after Atlantis-B, but I, I digress, uh, and it was stopped early due to harm. So we have yet another one that was stopped early due to harm. Dias-2, this one used Desmodoplace, and uh, they stopped studying it after it was uh, found to, to kill people again. So <laughs> they stopped it. ECAS-3, this is the, the, the study that showed not only can we give it for less than three hours, we're going to expand that up to four and a half hours, okay? And that's where this came from, okay? They only looked at people between three and four and a half hours. I want you to remember that time frame, okay? From three to four and a half hours, okay? That's what this study showed. And this is actually the single best positive trial of all of the positive trials, it was actually well done and very reasonable, okay? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about why I still don't believe what this study shows, but this is the single best piece of evidence, in my opinion, that, that thrombolytics may work for stroke. The range on your odds ratio starts at 1.02. Indeed. That's as good as it gets, Jim. That's as good as it gets, is, is the 1.02, which means that even if this result was true, and I'll show you why I don't think that it was, uh, then it you had a 95% interval of only 2% benefit, which is pathetic, okay? And no mortality benefit. IST3, now I actually listed this one as inconclusive because I, I trusted the authors when they built their study and used their primary endpoint that they were using the whole time. They reported it as a robustly positive trial, and it's a bunch of hooey, all right? I will tell you that in a, in a second why, okay? But this was an unblinded study that had a comedic number of flaws to it. And, I, and I'll show you why I listed it as, as not positive. So let's check the scoreboard. All right, so number of trials per resor result. We got four studies that were actually stopped because of harm. We got six that were negative, And then we have two that were beneficial. And I'd be willing to bet that most people in this room, if they haven't heard me speak on this before, have not heard about the other 10 trials that were not positive and have talked at nausea about, about the, the two that were, okay, which doesn't make any sense. Let's look at the number of patients. So you say, oh, well, maybe those, those trials that were, were negative, maybe they were tiny. Au contraire, my friend. Look at this. The number of negative trials were enormous. There's a ton of people versus we're actually basing quote-unquote standard of care on 1,100 people, okay? That's actually fewer than the number of patients that were in trials that were stopped early due to harm, Okay. This little red bar is what I call Dan's being a jerk bar because this is what would have happened if they allowed the studies that were killing people to keep going, okay?